How do you know that the gospel is true? What wonderful news if Jesus has died for our sins. But how do we know it's true? Well, in our passage today, where is it? Jesus has, uh, has just died. We, we saw that yesterday. It is finished was his cry. And we thought through how wonderful that statement that is, that he really has dealt with death. He's dealt with sin. He's dealt with the devil. He's triumphed there on the cross, even at the moment of greater shame. But how do you know it worked? And today we're going to see it's because it was predicted, it was witnessed, and it was explained by the scriptures as well. Let's let's pray and let's get into it. Father, we thank you for your powerful word and for your son who is at the center of it, his death in our place. Help us today to have confidence and to be able to answer those who might ask these questions that they might have the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. We're in John chapter 19 and uh, it's been wonderful and dramatic and and uh, as we've seen Jesus go through awful things, but totally in control, loving people around him, caring for his followers, showing everything about him. One of the things I, I uh, should have th thought of yesterday when we saw it is finished and he was drinking and said, I am thirsty, uh, was he, through the gospel he'd said several times if John's gospel uh, that he's come to offer living water, water so that those uh, who thirst may not thirst again. You know, it's not drinking. When you come to him, it's not like drinking normal water. You get thirsty again a, a couple of hours later. But he's offering to quench our thirst. And yet he was thirsty for us. Uh, and so uh, we come to, how do we know that's true? Well, let's let's read the scriptures. We're in John chapter 19, and we pick it up at verse 31. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. And so here is this final moment that Jesus has already uh, gone. Uh, he's died. And here is the proof of the pudding that the soldiers themselves know what a dead body looks like. They are experts in this thing. Uh, we see the situation is the Jews are offended by having dead bodies hanging around on the Sabbath. And so that, that it shows again their utter hypocrisy, isn't it? That, they have engineered this situation with great evil in their hearts to get rid of someone that they hate, and yet they want to be religiously pure. And so they bargain with Pilate. He says, okay, he doesn't want trouble. I mean, he's given in to their will already in crucifying him. And so the soldiers come out and do their dirty work. They, they would break the legs of criminals to speed up their death if it had dragged on for some hours. Uh, and they wanted it to hurry up. Uh, if you're unaware, the gruesome nature of crucifixion is you, uh, the, the people are hung there on the cross. They're nailed through the feet and through the hands. And so um, you, you, you're, if you let go and you're just hanging on your arms, you, it's a, you suffocate to death in the end. Uh, and so it's a grim way to do. And so your body naturally acts and you push up on your feet to take the weight off the chest and the compression there. And so they would be standing effectively or pushing up on the nail through that went right through both legs, one giant nail uh, that was there. And so uh, they to, to speed up the process, they'd come and break their legs so they could not push up anymore. And so the suffocation would come. And so that's what the soldiers do. Um, it's their normal process. Uh, they come to Jesus though, and they know he is already dead. Uh, and so we're told that that fulfills the scripture. And 
You can find several places in uh, the, the Bible where it's predicted throughout the thing, both by uh, a example of um, a sort of a, a picture that God would set up in the sacrificial system at the Passover, <coughs> but also in the Levitical sacrifices. Uh, the priests were and the families were to break the bones of the animal they were sacrificing. It's kind of this funny rule that until Jesus comes and dies this way, no one would understand. But then in uh, the Psalms, Psalm 22, uh, not one of my bones will be broken. And so here is both the image in the Old Testament that's um, that's then got a prophecy around it about the nature of Jesus' death but all pointing to the fact that Jesus' death is as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice, as our Passover lamb, just like the Passover lamb in Exodus 20, 12, uh, 46, isn't to have its bones broken, uh, just as the other sacrifices aren't to have their bones broken for our sins. So this one, uh, it, it's pointing out the fact that the prophecy and the fulfillment are pointing out that the image is being fulfilled. And so there are these predictions, and I think that's part of the how you can know it's true, that, uh, that, that all these things were told about years and years ahead, and then Jesus comes, and in the big details, the little ones, Jesus fulfills them all through his life, and particularly his death. Most of the, the prophecies are around his, his death. Uh, and the, 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 what exactly will happen? You know, the gambling for the clothes, the being thirsty, and and now that none of his bones will be broken. But there's another intriguing one that we'll come to in a moment from Zechariah to do with uh, the blood and the water that flow. See, what do the soldiers do when they they find Jesus dead already? Well, they they're sure he's dead, but they you know want to guarantee it, so there's no question. And so one of them shoves the spear up through Jesus' side, bringing a flow of water and of blood. And there's lots of people have tried to explain how that happens. And there are several ways it could have happened. Uh, if they pierce the stomach, uh, that would bring out um, clear fluid as well as gore. Um, some have suggested that it hit his heart. Uh, coming up through the side and hit his heart and the plasma separates out and so you get clear and red at the same time. Uh, either way, it's a guarantee that he's a goner, right? He, he is gone from this world, um, that he's passed away. Um, you can't, you know, they, they indicate as, uh, and there may be other explanations as well, but he's dead, dead, dead. And the soldiers know it, the soldiers have proven it. Uh, but all of it is part of this prediction. There's also, though, a second part of the evidence, and that is the witness, right? These things really happened as the scriptures had predicted. And John was there as an eyewitness to it all. He didn't have to make all this stuff up and formulate a story. He's the one of the, the disciples, but he's also got backup, right, from the the uh, other part, the, the ladies that we know were there from the last chapter, uh, the three Marys and uh jesus auntie there's the crowds there's the soldiers as the stories went around no one came forward and contradicted the eyewitness evidence right they knew it was true uh everyone knew he was dead uh and that these things had happened just as he said and so there's the prediction there's the 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 ever the eyewitness testimony but also the explanation because uh, the um, the predictions from the Old Testament aren't just uh, these items will happen and it'll just it'll be like this. No, they're explained as they happen, and that brings us to the the really interesting one I think in Zechariah uh, chapter twelve and verse ten. They will look on the one they have pierced, uh, and so uh, you might say, well, here's the fulfilment of just. You know, the, these steps had to be taken. That's the, the one who was coming would have to be pierced. But when you go and read Zechariah, he's actually explaining what's happening on the day that they look on the one that they have pierced. Zechariah chapter 12, I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
a spirit of grace and supplication. This is God promising one day to bring his grace uh, and his uh, to people. Um, and a spirit of grace where they will um, be looking for God's mercy and a spirit of supplication where they'll be begging for God to come. They will look on me, he says, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And it's interesting because who is it that they have pierced? They will look on me, says God, the one they have pierced, but they'll also mourn for him, the one they have pierced. And so who is the one that's pierced uh, that they gaze upon? And, in, and it's the day that the spirit of grace and supplication comes. It's, well, it's God and it's the one who's coming, the human, the the man. And so who is Jesus? Well, he is God, the one they have pierced. But he's also the one God was sending to be pierced, the Savior. He goes on, on that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimnom in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, the wives and so on. And I'll uh, skip down. He goes through a whole list of it, like here's the mourning that's going on, and uh, Jesus' disciples had scattered, and they were from different tribes, and so on. And this mourning really was happening because thousands of thought had put their hope in the Lord Jesus, uh, and and yet he he was gone uh, as far as they could tell by the judgment that had been handed down by the Jewish leaders and then by Pilate. But notice in chapter thirteen of Zechariah. On that day, so the day that they, the spirit of grace and supplication comes, the day that they look on me, the one they have pierced, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And on that day, God's going to do amazing work in cleaning up the sinfulness the, and so on. But notice on that day, this fountain will be open to cleanse from sin and impurity. And you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, that's the explanation of what's happening. Where is cleansing for sin going to happen? Well, it's going to happen as they, they look on the one they've pierced in Jerusalem. And you go back and say, well, what, what in the Old Testament, in the sacrificial systems, are the things that cleanse from sin and impurity? And it's interesting because they're very different things. Uh, one is uncleanness, that is uh, breaking the sort of the uh, the ceremonial laws. There's all sorts of things that you do that. Some of them aren't even to do with uh, bad intentions. If you've ac accidentally touched a dead body, you're unclean in the law. But that's not sinful, is it? No, it's, that's not about breaking God's moral code of murdering and stealing and so on. What do you do when you've been caught in sin or when you someone's pointed out your sin? Well, you offer a sacrifice and that sacrifice has to have its blood shed, right? And so blood is the payment for sin. But what do you do for uncleanness in the law? How do you uh, get cleaned up from that spiritually where well, you go to the priest and you get washed in pure water? And so this fountain in that's going to be there on that day that they look on the one they pierce is going to be a fountain that cleanses from sin and from impurity it's going to be a fountain of blood and of water and so it's it's no accident that when they pierce jesus side out flows blood and water showing that the fountain is open that we the cleansing happens and that there can be joy even in the midst of the morning because it's not the loss of the one we hoped would be king. Actually, it's the coming of God who's going to be pierced, who's going to pour out a fountain, opening a fountain that day of cleansing from sin and impurity. And so be confident in the gospel. And as you, you talk to people and share your faith, and they have questions, you might want to say, well, actually, all of this was predicted. All of it was eyewitness accounts showing that the predictions came through in in, in graphic, gruesome detail, but also that the, it was explained beforehand in the Old Testament in what would what was taking place when these events would happen. For instance, in Zechariah chapter twelve and thirteen, it's not just these events will happen, but why? Why? What is God doing through them? And then they're explained as Jesus does them, and the New Testament uh, points it out and and puts joins all the dots together 
to show you this wonderful thing that God has done for us. This most magnificent moment, greatest cruelty, but the greatest salvation that God could ever have thought of to cleanse us by the death of his son in our place on the cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonder of the Lord Jesus. Thank you that the fountain has been poured out of blood and water to cleanse from sin and impurity through the one that pierced. We thank you that he fulfilled everything that you said about him and that everything about his death was predicted. Uh, thank you that it was witnessed and thank you that it's been explained before and after the event. And so we can know for sure that the cross really worked, that Jesus is good for his promises, that he is a saviour worth following, that he is in fact God become man and dying in our place. He has brought us this cleansing. And so we thank you that it rests not on our efforts, but on your wonderful mercy. And thank you that you've poured out this spirit of grace and supplication that we can call on you confidently to receive your grace and your mercy in our time of need. Uh, in the time of our need for our sin to be washed away. And thank you, you've done that. And in any time of need now, we are yours. And so thank you for the reconciliation that Jesus has brought, the cleansing, the healing, the, 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 the bringing us together with you and the hope that we have through that. And so help us to live each day in thankfulness, in joy, and keep reflecting on uh, and, and sticking with Jesus, knowing that it's all perfectly true because you predicted it. It was the eyewitness testimony you explained. And so help us never to walk away. We pray for those who are asking the hard questions that we come across, that we're able to point them to the truth of the gospel and explain it to them and help them come to receive the life that you're offering through this wonderful death in our place. In Jesus' name we pray for his glory. Amen. God bless everyone. Catch you God willing for another devotion tomorrow.